So everybody's there. Hello. Um, so before I introduce Lana, which pretty much you all know her now, I want to remind you that we have a yes and a no thing. Yes, we have changed Lunch with the Leader to be on Thursdays. And the reason we did that was that the farmer's market is no longer going to be in the library parking lot, which was the problem because we um, had no parking. <laughs> so they are going to remain at the, um, uh, I don't know, the judicial center across the street. So that's why we changed back to Thursday so we could go shopping before. And we're all thinking that's happening sometime in our lifetime here. So that's number one. But here's the other part. But <laughs> next month, because of league day at the legislature, which is on Thursday the 18th, we are not doing what I said we were doing. And we are not going to be meeting on that day on Thursday. We're going to be meeting on Tuesday. But you will get way more information than you ever want regarding that. So um, more information on that as, that as that gets nearer. But in case you were thinking about making a doctor's appointment on Tuesday, don't. So that's what I'm gonna say, right? So, so Lana is here. You know how to do this now. You can put things in the chat box. She'll be talking for about 35, 40 minutes or so. Um, and we can interject if we need to, or you can wait until the end. Depends on how important it is. I'm going to look at this chat box. We're hoping our internet stays on. If not, <laughs> Ellen's on, Ellen's somewhere on my next page, I think. Um, is on another Mesa. So we're hoping um, if our Mesa goes off, North Mesa is still on. So your co-host, Ellen, okay? Okay. Uh, you got it. Okay. So okay. this is Lana uh, at Atkinson and she is a professor at UNM and she's going to talk to us about the legislative session. Oh, I'm, I'm talking about the election. I'm not- Oh, the election. About... Okay, whatever, fine. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me uh, put on my PowerPoint. So uh, we have that and start the slideshow. Okay. So um, we sort of just finished the election uh, yesterday. So it seemed like a good time to have a reflection. I'm certainly excited to be here. This is my uh, first big post-election talk. Um, so I thought I'd just title it uh, Musings of a Political Scientist on the Aftermath on the 2020 Election and its Aftermath. Um, I'm looking forward to your comments and uh, you know, thinking about where we've been and sort of where we're headed. <clears throat> I think when we look at this election, we can certainly say that uh, we made a decision in this election. We chose President Biden, who was inaugurated yesterday, but we certainly can say that America is very divided country. Um, and if we think about what the main takeaways are from this election, I think we can say that American voters really want a competent and center, you know, probably a little center right, maybe a little center left uh, leadership. Uh, certainly if we look at ideological uh, ratings in uh, voter surveys, we find a nation that is, that is center right, uh, but a partisanship that is center left. So there's a little bit of confusion in there. Um, Trump lost what was in what was actually a very close battle uh, for mostly failing to handle COVID well, and you know probably for some chaos and division as well. And Democrats lost quite a bit as well, especially where voters feared too aggressive progressivism. Our nation is bitterly divided, although again, most of the voters are probably in the center, but the extremists in both parties are unusually loud. The Senate is basically tied 50-50. The House is nearly tied, 222 Dems, 211 GOP, three vacant, probably uh, those each will uh, go up a tiny bit. Um, in the end, it'll look about 51% to 49%. Biden in this election had virtually no coattails, which is sort of amazing and says that unlike the last election, which we could certainly say was a change election, this election was not a change election. The big questions remain mostly unresolved. Both parties face huge internal battles over future directions and leadership. 
Biden is clearly a transitional leader. He's here to manage COVID, perhaps if he can bring the volume down um, in, in you know, the broader society. So what happened? It was an unexpectedly close election. I'll talk about the polls later, but uh, the polls certainly showed that there was going to be a democratic blowout at both the presidential level and that there were going to be strong coattails. And that wasn't the case. Clearly, there was a split decision by the American public. If we look at this chart that I put together at the bottom, you can see sort of the last presidential and then this election. So we have you know, a White House flip. The Democrats gained three in the Senate. The House, however, Republicans gained 12, and they're likely to gain more in 2022. Uh, the likelihood of a Republican House is very high, um, especially with redistricting um, right in front of us. State, le state legislative chambers, uh, we had two increases for Republicans, and we had one change in governorship. So you can see that that is a very divided um, record for an election. And again, that's very clearly not a change election. If we look at uh, the popular vote and the electoral college vote, of course they matched in 2020. Uh, President Biden got the same amount of electoral votes as uh, President Trump got in 2016. And the popular vote was uh, you know, within 5%, which is sort of what political scientists use as a measure of a close competitive contest. So we had the biggest engagement of the public since 1900, which is just amazing. Uh, you know, Back in 1900, 18 year olds couldn't vote, women couldn't vote, African-Americans couldn't vote in parts of the South. So it was a very small electorate compared to what it looks like today. And we've had the you know, second highest since, uh, since 1900. Of course, 2008, just a few years ago, was also very high, but we really took the cake here in 2020 when we look at the data nationally. COVID certainly did not stop uh, democracy when it comes to turnout, protests and other kinds of activities going on this year. Engagement in politics was very, very high. And Americans also believe that it really matters. And this is a huge change from just 20 years ago when, you know, basically, you know, there's not a dime bit of difference between Democrats and Republicans. People don't seem to see it that way anymore. And in fact, you know, 80% 80, 80 of uh, voters said it really matters who wins the presidential election. Perhaps that's a reason for increased uh, activity. We had a really disrupted election. We don't have a lot of disrupted elections. If we think about all the presidential elections uh, since 1900, um, you know, we can say there's been 11 recessions, nine Supreme Court vacancies in the year, same year, eight sustained protests six wars and two pandemics. And uh, when we have three or more disruptions, we almost always see a change in power. If we look back at 1932, when uh, FDR came into power, the Great Recession hit in 1929, we can say that literally every incumbent democratic leader around the world lost. So people really respond to the things that are immediately before them. And you know, when things aren't going right, um, they really blame the incumbent. I think it's you know just to mention right now, uh, Americans feel that the United States is is on the wrong track. Seventy three percent of Americans feel that way. Huge, very unusual. So uh, crazy year. We hadn't seen uh, as many disruptions since 1968. Um, another very very close election. Spending this year was just off the charts. We doubled spending from 2016 into 2020, which is just the money that we're pouring into elections is, is just unbelievable. And, uh, you know, this, and this chart actually excludes what uh, happened in the U.S. Senate in Georgia. So we're missing another, you know, half a million uh, dollars um, in this chart. So we can see that you know, compared to 2016, federal spending on elections more than doubled. Um, you can see that uh, this was especially a favorable year 
for um, for Democrats, right? 65% of that spending was by Democrats, only 35 was uh, by Republicans. The last year that we saw such a divergence in spending between the two that it wasn't very close was back in 2008. And in that year, of course, the Democrats took control of the House, Senate, state legislatures, governorships, it was a change election. So these are very different elections, despite their, their sort of underlying similarities in some ways. If we look at New Mexico, New Mexico spending was also up a great deal. Um, so here's the, on the left-hand panel side is the spending in the Senate contest. And that's uh, 2018 compared to 2020. So 2020 is orange here and 2018 is blue. Uh, so you can see that uh, the Democratic incumbent spent a little less than Lujan uh, in the open seat. Of course, the GOP uh, com competed more in the 2020 race uh, with uh, Ron Ketty as their candidate. Still nothing, right? I mean, less than 50% of what uh, uh, Senator Lujan uh, spent. This was a very close race. This was a 52, 48% race. Um, and you know, even with that kind of, of, of spending difference, in fact, what we can see is that despite the incredible spending of the Democrats uh, across all these elections, um, that you know, really they did not do near as well as would have been predicted by the polls, um, by the spending. Um, so, so there's a lot going on under the hood here. Uh, if we look over at the right-hand side, this is the House races compared in 2018 and 2020. Uh, the blue this time is, is Democrats. Uh, so the first two are 2020, the second two, I mean, the first two are the first CD, the second two are the second CD, the third section is the third CD. Um, obviously the first and third CD are, are very, very blue, especially the first CD. Um, has has used to be, you know, only 20 years ago, a very very competitive seat, and has turned into an urban, uh, very progressive blue seat over time. Here is the second seat where, uh, you know, we had a repeat race with Yvette Harrell and uh, Social Torres Small, um, and you can see in both cases in 2018 and 2020, Social Torres Small spent, you know, over twice as much. Um, as her opponent, Yvette Harrell, but Yvette Harrell actually came out um, on top. So very interesting spending patterns um, in New Mexico following what we see nation nationally, both in terms of winners and closeness of race that we may not expect. Um, we've had the fewest legislative in terms of this not being a change election and the status quo election. We had the fewest legislative changes since 1946. In the last uh, four years, uh, we had two in 2020, New Hampshire went red and two in 2019, Virginia went blue. Uh, so really, you know, if we look back, there's been much greater tumultuous times in terms of we are in a very uh, stable period. Um, it, it appears electorally um, not much change at least went on this year. Uh, New Mexico turnout, uh, like the nation, was its highest in the last 20 years. Um, and we had many, many vo more voters. We had over 920,000, about 920,000 voters in New Mexico, a new record for us. And we just barely passed our high in 2008 of 61.2. We're now, we went up to 61.3%. And keep in mind in 60, in 2008, when we had that, oops, when we had that high, uh, we were still a purple state then, and there was so much money spent by uh, President Obama's campaign on New Mexico. He had, um, he had in every county, he had offices. Some counties in New Mexico are very small, so that's pretty amazing. I uh, spent tons and tons of money here, uh, given that we had basically no money spent on the presidential race here. Uh, that's really quite amazing uh, in terms of mobilization. Um, if we think about critical states, we had sort of eight critical states in 2016. We had seven states within a 3% margin uh, this year. Uh, of course, the biggest change was Georgia that was plus five Republican and went you know, basically 50-50. That's a, 
a, a, a race of uh, 11,000 vote difference, uh, roughly 11 to 12,000 votes. Arizona, of course, went from blue to red as well, uh, moving several points. Uh, where we see uh, a state moving back, of course, is Florida. Florida, a, a bellwether state, and is no longer. And we notice that Ohio doesn't even make our chart. Right, Ohio is no longer a bellwether, uh, appears to be no longer a bellwether state and is moving red. In fact, one anomaly, one sort of like, you know, just interesting tidbit about the election is not a single bellwether county uh, survived this election. We have no bellwethers anymore. Um, no coattails for Biden this election, amazing. Can he claim a mandate? Probably not. Uh, he's really got to be careful about uh, his, uh, you know, where he moves his policies. If we think about sort of the biggest change election in the last hundred years, that would be 1932 with FDR, uh, you know, huge Democratic majority brought in that lasts, you know, literally 40 years uh, in the House of Representatives. Uh, when he came in, the change in the president's party share of the House and Senate vote was 45% amazing, right? If we look at, you know, President Biden, you know, his is one of the lowest, right? It's negative. Actually, he lost, lost seats, nearly 5% of seats. Um, I think only John F. Kennedy does worse than him in 1960, uh, there at the end. Um, and of course, that was also a very, very close race um, in 1960, also filled with allegations of fraud and dead voters voting in Chicago um, and things like that. Thinking back historically, often things we see today, we've also we've seen in the past, but the problem for today's politics is everything is so amplified uh, and the rhetoric is so loud that we feel it much more strongly than we ever have before. Um, if we think about state legislative seats, of course, we talked about the state legislators that's changed powers uh, to in 2020 and two in 2019. But if we think about sort of underlying that, we can, uh, you know, think about from Democrats to Republicans, we had 215 legislative seats change from Democrat to Republican. And from Republican to Democrat, we had 78 change. Now, back in 2018, we saw a huge change going the other way. So this was just sort of a, a you know, somewhat of a reset. But those are big swings and big changes that happen uh, in very little time. People, people do not feel that the parties are representing them. They do not feel or feel uncertain about who to support, at least in, in that middle area. Um, and so there's a, just a lot going on under the hood in American politics, a lot of change going on. Um, it's really clear uh, when the elect electorate is seeking change, it shows that down ballot. We talked about uh, the change for FDR a couple slides back. Um, if we just look at sort of, sort of compare Obama, which was a really recent change election to President O'Biden, you know, the difference in the popular vote, seven, little over 7% for Obama, 4.5% for Biden. But Obama added eight seats to the Senate, while Biden only added three. Obama added 21 seats to the House, while Biden lost 12. Obama gained a governor, while Biden lost a governor. These are not, right, again, these are not change election numbers. Obama shows change election. And what that means for Biden in terms of legislating is he's in a really tough spot, right? He's really got to think about this. He, he certainly can do a majority, but elections come every year. And he has to think not about now, but also about uh, the party in the future. The issues in the election were, you know, mostly the economy and COVID, 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 COVID. And you know, here I have two panels. One is the most important issue facing the count country, and the other one is the most important issue facing uh, in, in your vote decision. And you can see that that and so reds are for you know Republican percent of that 41, and blue is Democrat. So you can see there were clear differences between uh, partisans in terms of their priorities and what they thought were the most important things. The economy. 
for uh, you know Republicans, uh, the uh, the virus for Democrats, racial inequality turns up for Democrats, but really not at all for uh, Republicans. Um, economy, you know, and the jobs again, that's always number one for Republicans. So there's there's differences between the two, um, but clearly in a in a change election in terms of uh, you know, what caused the defeat of an incumbent president, you know, really COVID, all of these disruptors, you know, those, those kinds of things, uh, incumbent presidents cannot overcome um, historically. 55% um, just to hit home the importance of COVID, 55% um, disapproved of President Trump handling of the coronavirus, 47% of that 55 strongly. So it's not like people were iffy at all. Um, and 83% said that the federal government's response was an important factor in their vote. And 40% the single most important factor. Really think COVID overshadowed this election more than anything else, at least when it came to vote. But of course, how people thought about that role was shaped by who they watched in this really fascinating look at sort of polling and who you want and what you think. Uh, the media asked, the US has controlled the outbreak as much as it could, which, which attitude do you agree with more? Or the US, uh, and I can't read that because it's a, you guys are all over that, um, has not controlled the outbreak as much, that's what it says, as it could. Um, if you were on, on Fox News, Right, 90% of you said the US has controlled the outbreak as much as you could. But if you were on CNN, MSNBC or NPR, you know, nearly all of you uh, said, no, the US has not done, uh, has not controlled the outbreak as much as it could. Amazing differences for people um, observing the news and who they're choosing to get their news from. The fragmentation that has occurred in our media market is perhaps the biggest driver of our divisiveness and our distrust of each other and is a, the most worrisome thing uh, for us, not only us, but for democracies around the world. One thing we really learned from this election is that Americans are diverse, both within and between groups, and that you have to appeal to them as individuals and not in, independent uh, and not as necessarily simply a member of a group. Um, of course, political scientists knew back in the 80s and 90s that there is no Hispanic vote per se, that there are many Hispanic votes, um, but we actually sort of lost track of that in the 2000s and on, and suddenly it hit us back pretty hard in 2020. Cuban Americans overwhelmingly supported Republicans, which is, of course, why Florida has become so red, um, and different Hispanic groups support the Democratic Party um, at different strengths uh, below that. And we can also see that even on issues of immigration and civil rights, that different issues matter across groups. If we look on the right panel, you can see the priorities for this election's top issues for Latinos, African-Americans and uh, Asians. And uh, you see that Latinos and Asians, it's the coronavirus, also African-Americans, everyone agreed it was the coronavirus, but then for Latinos and um, uh, Asians, it's jobs in the economy, and then healthcare for African Americans, racial justice, and jobs in the economy. So even within the Democratic coalition, there are certainly differences in priorities and preferences in uh, policy pursuits and uh, ways to go in the future. Um, interestingly enough, you know, exit polls suggest that Trump lost the election because of decreased support of white voters. Uh, black and Hispanic voters actually increased their support for him. Black men from 6% to 13%, um, but black men by 6% from 13 to 19% and black women from 4% to uh, 9%. So uh, pretty amazing. And LGBTQ support doubled for President Trump from 14 to 27%. Uh, which, you know, when you have certainly an, an, a narrative focused on identity politics in the Democratic Party uh, is certainly hard to explain. I think there's a lot of economic things going under on, on under that hood, as real as as, uh, as well as real differences 
between college educated people who rule this country and working class people who work in this country. And these people have very different views and perspectives on the world. Um, and uh, that's another problem for all again of democracies, I think going forward, the difference between sort of the educated class and the uneducated class in opportunity um, is, is very, very different and a very different experience in life. Why did Donald Trump get the second highest number of votes of any presidential candidate in history? Um, of course, with President Biden being the first. Well, globalization and the new economy are certainly key factors. People are still very concerned about um, you know, globalization and where it's heading. Um, the fact that there's this vacuum in terms of global leadership with China um, and the US, you know, neither claiming the top status at the moment uh, is creating a vacuum that's difficult for people. Uh, people are certainly afraid of the digital transformation and where that might leave them. Uh, we're talking about, you know, uh, automatic car driving in the future, right? Uh, little truck drivers, truck driving is a really important, uh, it serves 2 million uh, uneducated uh, workers who make a really good living uh, driving trucks. In a few years, we're gonna be getting rid of um, a lot of those people in favor of autonomous trucking and autonomous vehicles. Uh, automization could take away, you know, upwards of 70 million jobs in the next few years in America. Some people are saying these things certainly are leading to concerns about the economy. Uh, I would say anger at a political correctness. Uh, lots and lots of polls point to uh, people being very unhappy uh, with the constant change and what makes for good words and bad words and the political correctness that goes on and their inability to speak freely. Um, so there's a lot of concern over that um, elite condensation, college graduates, again, people on the coast look down on people in the middle. Um, and I think that for at least socialism, there's very clear differences between Democrats and Republicans um, in terms of issues that came up this year, like defunding the police um, or other issues like that, that were also of importance. We had another polling failure this year, uh, you know, which is the difference between the actual vote and the estimated vote in the polls. In this election, the polls were biased towards Democrats. The real killer politics polls had Biden up 7%, 538 had him up 8%. Um, in the end, the polls actually sort of got Biden's uh, numbers accurate, but not uh, Trump's numbers. Um, so they were off by about three percentage point, three to four percentage points in the end. If we look back over time, which is what this slide and these all this data over here to the right shows, what we basically find is that this four to you know three to four point average for Democrats is very consistent going back, you know, more than twenty years. We can find this sort of uh, a consistent Democratic uh, advantage. Um, and so we have a long-term history of, of a democratic bias in polls. It doesn't seem to be random. Um, and what are the implications of that for uh, turnout for Republicans or turnout for Democrats if they think they have it when they don't could, could affect either group negatively. Um, you know, how do we uh, think about that? What does that mean about data in the polls? Does that mean that really people are more you know, slightly more conservative on attitudes. Um, that may not be the case. It could be just something about willingness to uh, state your polls, but you, who you prefer. However, I've been polling in New Mexico now for uh, too long that I can remember that I know like 20 years or something like that. And I've gotten a lot more angry, angry voters and angry people I never had before 2016. And there's something that anger that I hear and see from people who respond to me and, um, you know, <laughs> in, in very rude ways sometimes is, uh, is, is disappointing and, and, dis and, and disconcerting in terms of, uh, you know, what that means for people's attitudes and feelings um, about, 
um, about our institutions and what they're producing. So evidence of a likely voter problem is that we had two, um, we had two basically exit polls going on this year, one by AP, which was called VoteCast, and the traditional sort of Edison research, which was the one that historically was used as a consortium of newspapers and um, news outlets. Um, and they get really different results about what the electorate look, looked like. So Edison research says that, you know, 65% of the electorate was white, while AP says it was 74%. Um, you know, if we look at white, no college, in one that's 34%, in another that's 44%. Um, and if we look at, you know, another good example down here, uh, you know, how we voted suburbans, Biden was a Biden plus three or Biden plus 10. These are really large difference from two exit polls that should be overlapping a lot, lot more than they did. So there's some problem with, <clears throat> with our polling and uh, we have a lot of uncertainty going forward what exactly all of this looks like. Um, but the problems with the polls were, were much, you know, very similar to what they were in 2016. Uh, pollsters spent a lot of time trying to fix those models. Um, and apparently they didn't, so that's a little worrisome. Um, again, the implications in terms of, you know, who turns out or who doesn't turn out uh, could potentially be negative on both sides. Um, and, you know, what, what does it mean about what we learn about policy from things or generally what we learn about what's going on? I think that's an ongoing question that we have to answer us. Of course, the election aftermath has been fraught with allegations of fraud from the president and others. Uh, the January 6th riot at the Capitol during the counting of the electoral votes was, you know, shocking to all of us and, uh, you know, difficult to comprehend and, and, and fathom. A second impeachment trial will begin after Speaker Pelosi sends the articles of impeachment to the Senate. Um, that would mean that President Trump would be the first president ever to be impeached twice. Um, she has not sent them over yet and sending them over would likely delay the confirmation of Biden's, um, ca uh, Biden's cabinet because business in the Senate would have to stop. I know that Biden came out and said, well, you know, you could do that in the morning and do my stuff in the afternoon or vice versa, but the Senate makes its own rules. <laughs> And that has to be something that's done by unanimous consent. And I assure you that there's got to be one Republican who doesn't want to do that um, and probably more. So if they move forward with the trial, that's going to displace, uh, you know, a focus on the current and new administration. And, you know, politics is really always, or it should be, in my opinion, about moving forward and not about looking backward. Looking backward is not the direction of politics. Looking forward is you want to focus your administration on what you're doing and not the past. Um, so that could be a bad move, but we'll see how that turns out. Did Wyden win legitimately? <clears throat> uh, this was a just a poll like a few days ago done by NBC. And you know, 61%, three inviters, three and five voters said that he did, and only 35% said that he did not. I think that's interesting because they asked the identical question in 2001 about George W. Bush, and at that point, only 55 people accepted it. Right? Think about you know 2000. Think about 2020. Um, the amplification of of you know, people's perceptions of the feelings is so much more intense and extreme than it was in 2000. And again, that's disturbing. That has to do with our cultural life and how that's impacting our ability to uh, trust one another. But even though there's a lot of belief, a, a major, you know, well over a, a, a majority of voters, uh, believe that that Biden won legitimately. They are much more divided on the election more generally. The same survey asked which statements come closest to what you think about uh, the government. Uh, ah, this is where I can't see uh, because of the, so I'm just going to go here. Uh, which statement comes closest to what you think about a federal government investigation of the 2020 election? This is not necessary because widespread changes in how people can vote 
means procedures must be reviewed to guarantee an accurate vote count to increase confidence in the electoral process. That's about half the country. And then half the country say, oh, it's not necessary because states have already certified the results following investigations and they found no evidence of widespread fraud that would change the election results. So even though there is a belief in the legitimacy of the election, how we should look at this election and whether we should you know, go back and look at our election procedures or not is deeply contested uh, by, uh, by uh, Americans. Um, and you know, this is basically just reflecting, right, the, the vote, uh, the 2020 vote. So uh, there's still something to be done there. I think, you know, we also need to think, think about things in perspective. And what was so interesting is they repeated a bunch of polls in this survey that they had uh, repeated in previous years. And so we could take a look at them and sort of compare them. Compared with other public accounts that have concurred during uh, the lifetime of Americans, such as uh, President Kennedy's assassination, the 9-11 terrorist attacks, an economic recession of 2008 and 9, and the coronavirus, how would you rate the impact of last week's protest that led to rioters overtaking the US Capitol? And this was repeated back in the 90s for the Oklahoma City bombing, and just say a half a year ago with just coronavirus. And it's very interesting that the Capitol riots either were getting used to craziness in our world, or uh, you know, we certainly see these events very differently back in you know, the Oklahoma City bombing, just thinking about how that was a uniting moment for America, you know, nearly everybody said it was hugely significant, right? I mean, if we combine those two columns, that's uh, over 96% of voters said it was important and significant. Coronavirus, only 38, capital riots, only 20%. Uh, percent. This, this is really showing and demonstrating our, our polarization um, and how we see the world uh, very, very differently uh, to one another. And of course, how we see it, you know, only 20, well, I guess that's now 30 years ago, not quite 25 years ago, um, how we were much more united when some event uh, hit us as a society. Things are very, very different now. If we think about uh, President Trump as he leaves office, you know, his approval rating is uh, one of the lowest, the lowest uh, that's ever uh, been recorded throughout his presidency. He only had a positive uh, approval in the first days of his presidency. And then it just, you know, went to straight polarization with Democrats hating him and Republicans loving him. Um, you can see that despite that, even at the end of his uh, end of his term, he was not at his lowest approval. His lowest approval was back in 2018 around the election. Um, and you can see that on his last day of office, he actually went up a slight bit. Um, so the future, can President Biden do it? It's possible that only he can fix it to take a line from President Trump. Um, maybe because he's a legislator more than an executive, he's more comfortable cutting deals. He's more comfortable thinking about these things, um, being more willing to do so. That might lead to the, the possibility of more centrist policy. He is a party centrist, more than an ideological moderate. Um, again, that makes him willing to compromise, but certainly he has in terms of his initial policies, you know, move the Overton window to um, to the left. So we'll see if he does maintain that or not. He's an institutionalist with great respect for the process and protocol that get, makes government work. So again, he respects the institutions and that should make a difference. He retains an optimistic view of Republicans. He's been in, you know, he's been in uh, politics for decades and decades, and he has many Republican friends. He works well with Senator McConnell, um, and he believes that there are many, many Bob Doles in the world. He's a transitional figure and he knows it. Um, he knows that he's here to govern well and he's not here to lead a revolution or a change election. But we are deeply divided within and between the parties. So why it might work, 
Biden, Pelosi, and Schumer have 120 years of federal legislative experience among them. They know how to cut deals. They have a majority right now in all, all you know, the legislative and the executive branch, but it's very small. So they really have to be able to cut deals or moderate Democrats are ultimately going to walk away and side with Republicans. They have elections in two years in the House and they are very concerned about that. The COVID and economic crisis demand cooperation. Um, so that might you know, push um, action towards centrist policies that everybody can support and get through quickly. Uh, moderates in both parties want progress, absolutely. And more Senate GOP states are at stake in 2022. So those GOP senators should be more likely, again, be willing to compromise. Why it might not work. The wings of uh, both parties, let's see if I can get rid of the, uh, there we go, yeah, that worked. <clears throat> Why it might not work, the wings of both parties oppose deals with the enemy and prefer causes to compromises. It's very interesting if you look at a uh, prediction of, uh, you know, Ocasio-Cortez's uh, votes, you find that she is actually much more moderate and that's because she refuses to vote yes on compromises. And there are other uh, people in the caucus who are the same, and there are people like that on both sides of the aisle. The pandemic, of course, which should bring us together as a nation, has become highly partisan. Ideologues in both parties want purity, and they threaten primary uh, challenges to members who do not uh, demonstrate their purity uh, with the more extreme members of the party. The House Democratic majority is at grave risk in 2020, 20, 2022, which might make Democratic House members uh, sort of gun shy in terms of legislation, might make them more careful. And I think perhaps most importantly, social media will continue to produce a fragmented media, fragmented realities for all of us, and deep, deep distrust of each other. Trust in the mainstream media is down to 40% in Gallup's most recent poll. These are the disturbing sides, but there is possible hope. Um, <laughs> macro trends, um, there's a lot of uncertainty for our future. Obviously this year is gonna be uh, dominated, continuing to be dominated by the uh, pandemic. Technology is continuing to accelerate. Uh, we're having our fourth industrial revolution. It's digital, it's AI, it's robotic. There's so much going on. It's changing so fast. My students, which used to change every, you know, five to 10 years, I'd see cultural changes with uh, sort of new uh, attitudes and new differences. I would say uh, since 2014, I'm seeing changes in new students every two years in terms of uh, their attitudes, their beliefs, their thoughts. I think that that has to do again with the changing technology and the information environment that especially young people are prone to. Um, you know, we're having again this vacuum of leadership at a global level. So there's sort of both, you know, globalization and deglobalization going on. There's a lot of uncertainty at the geopolitical level about what's going to go on. We have a hyper active political environment. Uh, normally people tune out between elections, but that doesn't seem to be the case, especially during pandemic. Uh, both in the left and the right have been energized by the 2020 election. Uh, lots of anger on both sides, amplified by social media, cable TV, podcasts, YouTube, everything. We have a huge trust deficit. We don't like each other. We don't trust each other. We don't want our children to marry people who are not like us. Um, things culturally are more divided than they've ever, ever been. We have a realignment going on uh, that is just you know very uncertain where it's going to go, um, and you know we really have sort of an identity crisis for the parties. Uh, who are the leaders? Um, in the Republican Party, of course, at this point, but underneath the hood, is it a moderate, right, uh, you know, 
Joe Biden or conservative Joe Biden, uh, or is it you know the squad, right? What is it that the parties represent under the hood? But you know my belief in American democracy is very strong, and it's flawed and imperfect, but it's robust and dynamic. Uh, change back and forth is actually typical in our in our history. We can see that you know in terms of public mood that if we look over time that it's a push to the right and then a push back from the left and then a push back to the right. And this has been the nature of our politics forever. Change back and forth is typical and it's good because it, it reduces corruption. Um, the status quo, the people are not as polarized as we might think. We are a right center nation, but extremists on both sides have large social media platforms and have the podiums. It's hard for anyone with sensible voices to be heard. But I think most importantly, American democracy is enduring and it will continue to endure. Okay, that's, that's my, and, and that's my thoughts. Uh, let's see if I can get back. Here. There we go. We actually do have some questions, which Excellent. I will read since I'm only doing that part, um, which I think a lot of us are going to agree with this one. Why don't we have, whoops, what happened to it? Oh, what? Why don't, well, wait, okay, stop this. Okay, got it. Why don't we have truth in reporting standards mandated by the FCC? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, truth, truth is a complicated word, I think, in that uh, context. Uh, whose truth? Um, there certainly was truth in uh, and they got rid of it, you know, sort of truth and reporting quite a long time ago, maybe that'll come back. Um, I think that truth is is a lot, you know, I mean, wh when was it a few years ago, the word truthiness, why, what, what is, you know, became an important word in our culture and in our society. And, you know, with the fragmented media, uh, a truth is much more elusive. So I think there are two things. One is, you know, what is the, what is the policy change? And then the second thing is, I think it's a lot harder in a, in, a, in a complicated, fragmented media world to figure out what exactly the truth is. Is that a democratic standard? Do we vote on what the truth is? I don't know. Um, uh, Felix, did that answer for you? I'm sorry? Uh, a little bit, a little bit. Uh, well, because I can see who asked the question. Um, I was asking Felix if that sort of answered his question, but but I will add on to that because I'm a political addict, is <laughs> that, um, can't help it. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I actually do go from CNN and MSNBC and NPR and I watch Fox and it can be the same exact comment. And it's like, whoa, you could be in two different countries. And I think that's kind of what Felix was talking about in terms of facts or, you know, Kellyanne. Well, those are alternative facts. I love that. I'm just now using that all the time. But I, I think you're right. And I'm sort of wondering what different stations are going to talk about when they don't have Trump to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's Fox says all the bad things about everyone else. So let me go on. This is to Amy. I don't even know if Amy's still here. She had to go to the dentist, but let me see. Um, I think that most, if not all, the data can be explained by the rise of Fox News and social media, which amplifies the lies spread by candidates and eliminates any attempt to draw conclusions in a rational fashion. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, you know, if, if you don't put MSNBC in there, you're really not being fair. I think CNN, I mean, if you're watching Hannity, I, the other day I watched Hannity, then I watched Lemon, then I watched Maddow. If you're watching any of those three people, those three people are are just incredibly divisive. I see those three people as the same person. I mean, I don't know. For me, they they just spew divisiveness. So I guess I, I see it as a little more equally, you know, uh, spread out. I do think media fragmentation is 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 the real problem. Um, if we look back, so I did a huge study about Katrina back in 2006. We literally 
saw very little difference in reporting between CNN and uh, Fox at the time. Both stations, you know, uh, criticized President Bush at the same rate, which is sort of surprising. You wouldn't think that today. That wouldn't happen today. We were stunned because we didn't think that it was like that, but it was. We did all the counts and looked at everything. The criticisms were just as strong in both places. Um, but you know that's not true now. If you get up every morning, and I had a colleague who did this for several years in the in recent years, she'd get up every morning and take a picture of the front page of Fox News and the front page of CNN News. They don't even talk about the same things. They don't even have the same agenda items. That wasn't true in 2006. So I think that this is a lot more about the changing nature of, of fragmented media and how media has fragmented over time. Anyone can find anything they want. And those bigger stations, all of them, have begun catering to a much smaller and preferred audience. Um, I think all of them have. I don't. I don't think that anyone, any, any, any station, any newspaper, you know, has some. Uh, you know, maybe maybe U.S. News and World Report because they're very short. I don't know, but uh, but there's not a lot of of, of moderates out there um, in the space anymore. The fragmented media is just huge, um, and it's fed to us. I mean, if you think about what's going on, the way I like to think about it, if you're on Twitter. Um, you know, that is an, an incredible algorithm. Twitter has thousands of people who are just like you. I like to think of them as a voodoo doll. You know, they've got all these voodoo dolls and they know exactly how to push that pin in to get you to look at the next thing and read the next thing. And that is the scariest thing going on in our world. We're all, you know, we're all, I, I tell my students, we're all driving down I-25, but we can't see each other. And so we're gonna run into each other and it's not gonna be pretty because even though we're all on the same highway, we can't see anyone. And it's, it's a really, it's a really uh, vexing problem for our nation, for you all, all the world, all the world. Right. Do you think that, um, I guess I never felt that I didn't trust. Yes, I saw that were different sides. I absolutely saw that, but I think talking about the fake media, which by the way, I do believe Fox is one of the top uh, stations for um, more conservatives than, and then crazy people like me who just, you know, can stand so much. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know that Fox is not a media source. So when people are saying we don't trust, don't trust the media, aren't we talking about everybody? Yep. Or one America or whatever, Newsmax, all those different ones. All I mean, they're all, I, I just never heard it before Trump. Mm. I'm not saying they didn't have different opinions. They definitely did. They definitely had their pros and cons, but I never heard anyone say, don't trust the media. But mm. I just may have missed that. Yeah, it certainly got louder. It certainly got louder. Um, I mean, you know, certainly got louder. There's no question. I just, you know, I think there's just a lot of blame to go around. Uh, and I think, Felix, you didn't say this, but I'll just read what you wrote unless you want, want to go with it. Uh, so he's talking about um, that it's right, that there are legislative tools can we use to require Fox to not corrupt the country? Um, Where are you? And then what is that? Do, do oh, well, sorry, that was, that was a bit of back and forth between me and Amy. Uh, so I was no. responding to Amy's comment. Um, <laughs> but if it's okay, do you mind if I just ask a question summarizing all of the... So um, uh, you talked about, you know, American politics is traditionally divided. Um, and from what I've read and, and been researching, um, it, you know, there's a, a researcher called Deverger. So there's Deverger's law, which says that if you are du only able to... Duverger? Uh, you know, thank you so much, because I've heard it so many times, never heard it actually pronounced correctly. Um, and, uh, and and so there was another question asked by Edward, Eduardo Santiago talking about um, ranked choice voting and open primaries and how that's going to heal the partisan divide. Um, I'll come out and describe myself. I'm the chair of the board for the Center for Election Science, and we're a nonprofit that's advocating for approval voting, um, primarily because ranked choice voting still creates two-party systems using Duverger's law. Um, and I was wondering kind of how familiar you, you are with it and whether you see it, you know, 
whether whether the way we vote really is the source of our divisiveness or or whether it's it's actually implicit in who we are. I mean, I think that's interesting. So, you know, historically, we would say that a two party system helps to bring people to the center because you know, there are more people in the center and it means that the candidates have to move to where all of the voters are. But then of course we, so that's like historically how we thought about it say before 2000. Um, and we could see that in the elections before 2000. But then, you know, in the seventies we started changing uh, like how we did our presidential primaries. Of course there's Citizens United which changed how we did our vote. And so what it seems to be today is that primaries are, are more important and they, they push candidates out because the, uh, the electorates in primary constituencies are much more conservative and much more liberal than uh, the, the you know, general election one. And so you know, a lot of battles in uh, election districts, of course, since we have a district-based uh, representative system uh, happen in the primaries. Um, so that results in more extreme uh, candidates. And of course, then money, the way money has evolved in our political system uh, also seems to be, so basically corporations haven't changed. If we look at, at money giving, they haven't changed how they give money. They still give money the same way. They want private benefits for their corporation. If Verizon is going before Congress, they're really focused on things that will help Verizon. And they really don't care about politics generally. But with the change in Citizens United, what we see is a lot of very, very wealthy people who enter politics, who have a lot of money, they can put their you know, money where their mouth is, and they do care about ideology, and they do draw lines in the stand. And we think that that has also pushed candidates out to the extremes as they seek money from uh, wealthy uh, individuals who do care about ideology. So, you know, uh, so, so what we see, right, is that we see different forces sort of working to create greater polarization um, in this context. And, you know, the consequence is a mo more polarized America. I mean, when I think about sort of representation, um, you know, for me, I would say that if I were wanting to make changes to our election system, I would think that a, a more, um, you know, getting rid of first past the post completely uh, would be the right thing to do. And, you know, go to some sort of uh, system where, you know, if you get 10% of the votes, you get 10% of the seats. Um, Proportional is, representation, yeah. Yeah, is a lot, you know, a lot fairer representation in, in the sense that people can vote what they want and have representation at least at some level. Of course, in a first past the post system, when you win, you win it all, right? And what's your advantage? Uh, what's the advantage to helping those who lost, right? And so it's very interesting this last year, I had, uh, first time this ever happened to me, I had someone call me and they said, hi, I'm a Republican. And I have this question, uh, historical question. And I always would, there was always some Republican I could call in the state about this, but there are no Republican leaders anymore, our entire state federal delegation is blue and I have nowhere to turn for my questions. And I thought, wow, that's, you know, that's democracy in a way failing because, you know, a good 35% of voters in New Mexico are Republican. And, uh, you know, how does, how does that feel to be completely uh, wiped out? They so, haven't met Harold, she's a Republican. No, they didn't, they didn't then because last year it was so chill to small. Right, right. I know, because I was calling down at CD2. <laughs> so uh -huh. I think that's, I mean, you know, so I, I think proportion, you know, if you want to make a big change, proportional representation is, is a way to go. But, uh, you know, that's, that's a really big change. I think ranked choice voting is interesting. Uh, we've done two cities in New Mexico, Las Cruces and Santa Fe have ranked choice voting. I've done surveys in both of those uh, post elections. There is not support for moving that to, you know, statewide. Uh, and just interestingly enough, Massachusetts voted it down, which was a big surprise. Uh, I think there are some interesting advantages, particularly maybe in in-party races, primary races, maybe for something like rate, ranked choice voting. Um, I don't know about general elections. I think if I look at what California is doing personally, 
you know, where's the innovation and in ideas when you have two people who, you know, have the same views and they win their sort of jungle primary? Uh, where's the competition for ideas? Um, you know, and I think I think that's potentially important. Not to dominate the conversation, but I specifically wanted to ask about whether you'd heard of the Center for Election Science about approval voting or were aware of um, uh, approval voting passing in Fargo, North Dakota and uh, St. Louis, Missouri, because that's, you know, that's that's my jam. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll shut up after, after that. And if you're interested, we'd love to work with you as well. I certainly am familiar with approval voting. I did not know that it passed in St. Louis um, or Fargo, North Dakota. Um, but I, I think I may have seen some, um, you know, maybe there was something on Twitter about that that I saw in passing. Um, uh, but I am familiar with the concept of approval voting. There's lots of different ways to vote. You know, one of the most important things, in fact, as we think about voting is that voting needs to be set up so that losers feel, you know, that the election is legitimate. That's, that's the most important thing about an election system because winners always feel good about the election system. And the real question is, you know, do, do losers feel good about the election system? And I think on that note, we can say that one interesting thing is people feel very confident that their vote was counted correctly. And so I think that that's a real positive for, uh, you know, perceptions of the electorate at an individual level. They don't feel, you know, they, you know, when we move that up, how confident do you feel that all the votes in the nation were correct, you know, correctly counted? They don't feel very good about that. That's extremely polarized. But an individual level, there's not really any, you know, difference between Democrats and Republicans. There's not, you know, at the individual level, people had a really good experience with voting. And I think that's just something positive about our election system. Oh, I can't hear you. You're off. Your sound is off. Sorry, the dog. Oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah, I'm back. Um, so I just wanted to just tell people it is a little bit after one and we can stay on. So that's not a problem unless it's a problem for you, Lana. But if people need to leave, you can do that. I'm see, I'm not I have a lot more questions in here. Um, but uh, I think some may have been answered because Felix you and Yes, please you, all ignore all of my questions and comments. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so anyway, I just want to give people that yeah. freedom. We, you know, we won't think you're impolite, so you won't either, Lana, uh, just because people have a, certain plans and, you know, we're all so busy now on these Zooms, could have another one on. So let me go on to Eduardo, because I don't know if Eduardo, if you, your question was answered. Could you share your thoughts regarding RCV and open primaries toward healing the partisan divide? Um, you know, I mean, there's this sort of myth in America that the answer to every political problem is more democracy. And I think that ranked choice voting represents that perspective. Um, I, I don't, I, I'm not, again, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm iffy on ranked choice voting. I, I think it has some pluses, but I also think it complicates things when you see, when you get to, when people, when, if you look at the elections, when there are many candidates running, people stop voting after about the fifth round, you know, they just, they don't, they're not interested. So even though you go, okay, this is going to lead to a majority, it does. But in the end, we what we're seeing is that the last and final grouping of people, a majority of the people who did vote that day didn't vote in that last round or the last few rounds. Um, so that's a little bit myth versus reality. Um, again, I, I think that competition is important in elections. I think that, you know, calling your opponent out for things is probably, you know, it's, it's conflictual, poli that's the nature of politics, but, you know, that's what helps weed out corruption. I think a pro potential issue with ranked choice voting is it leads people to not criticize their opponent because they're looking for the second vote or the third vote. And I worry about that because we need people to criticize their opponents and not just find them uh, attractive and why they want to, you know, if they're wanting their votes, that's a different incentive structure. And so I'm not sure about the implications of that for the health of a democracy. Now, you know, the, the counterpoint to that would be, well, you know, maybe there's less negativity and maybe that overrides that. But I think politics naturally is competitive, which is why we don't like it. You know, it's conflictual and it's like, oh, that doesn't feel good. I don't like that. But it is the nature of the beast. 
and that conflict is necessary and appropriate to educate voters and also to prevent, right? You know, that's mild conflict towards compared to what real conflict you would have if you didn't have elections. So, you know, that's that's a way to to deal with these things in a in a in a reasonable and and um, and uh, healthy um, uh, fashion. Um, open primaries, you know, they don't seem to, you know, definitely you create more participation. There's no doubt you create more participation. It's not clear if if it it does anything to really alter the nature of the candidates involved. You know, I mean, the reason, you know, most people are independents. Um, a lot of people are independents because they are, you know, journalists and other kinds of things, but they're actually really partisans. Um, and then the real, the real independents, right? The 10% of people who are really independent, you know, they're never gonna participate. They're really, they're hardly interested at all. They, you know, was, I'd be surprised if they voted in a primary. Most of them. Okay, I think Akanas, um, what role do you think the Libertarian Party played in this presidential election? I'm, I'm sorry, I was reading one of the comments. What? <laughs> oh, okay. I'm up on Akanas. Um, what role do you think the Libertarian Party played in this presidential election? This one, really, none at all. I mean, I yeah, there's um, yeah, no. No real, no real effect here. Not a lot of third, third party voting. Uh, sort of reminds you of uh, 2000, 2004, right? Uh, 2000, where you had more liberal, you know, compared 2000 to 2004, 2016 to 2020. No real third party action here. Okay, and our leader here, Barbara, is money in politics a significant factor in elections? You know, it, it you know, normally the person that spends the most money gets the most votes. Um, but, you know, interestingly, we saw in those slides that in this year, there was a great deal more spending on the Democratic side and on down ballot contests, there wasn't a great deal more winning. So, you know, it's not always the case that that happens. That is the normal case. Money, it's just huge in politics. It's just ridiculous how much money we spend on uh, campaigns and candidates. And I, I don't see that changing. I don't, I don't see any, I mean, it's just, but it is really gross. Yeah, and I'm probably part of that grossness. Um, <laughs> so, well, you're just giving, right? You're not spending, you're just. <laughs> right, I'm not spending, <laughs> giving. Um, and Barbara, again, how are surveys conducted now that people are giving up their landlines? Oh, well, most surveys are done online, you know, in these panels, these online panels. Everybody has their own panel, Reuters, uh, all of the news agency, Pew has a live panel. Um, so they, uh, most of the data is coming from, from panels, people who are sort of what we call professional respondents. Um, and um, so a really good one in terms of uh, representation, you know, they take like a virtual sample using the American Community Survey and then they match their online panel participants to all of the cells that they're trying to fill um, in their survey. So, you know, I need a, uh, you know, African-American who has a college degree from Detroit, you know, whatever, so that you fill all of those little cells in your survey. That would be a really good example of an online panel survey, um, but some of them aren't so good at all. Uh, they also supplement that. There's a lot of um, other kinds of, of, of surveying going on, including cell phones um, and what we call mixed mode um, panels where you know people are getting phone calls, they're doing them online, they're doing them on their cell phones um, via text um, or a phone call where you, you know, inter, um, uh, interactive voice recordings where you know, press one if you're voting for Biden, press two if you're, so uh, there's a lot of different stuff going on out there, just tons of different kinds of stuff. And some of it's better and some of it's worse and some of it we just don't know. And, and just Felix, do you want me to skip this one? Yes, yes, uh, skip me. We've talked about voting methods uh, okay. enough, I think. Okay, I'm trying to be fair and honest here balanced news. Um, H, this is from Meredith. Um, HB 79, 
is a wonderful election bill because it allows for independent voters to participate without needing to register with a party, which sort of goes back to what you were talking about. Will people vote and whatever? It will definitely increase, uh, it'll it definitely increase participation in the primaries, but I don't know uh, how much. And it's so interesting how these things work. I mean, you know, same day registration was instituted in New Mexico for the first time in this election. And uh, if you follow all the data on that, what was fascinating was, you know, we are a pretty blue state, not completely do, you know, I'm, I'm the one out there saying it's violet, but uh, we're a pretty blue state. And so you would expect that, and, and just the rhetoric around same day registration is this should help democratic voters, right? Young voters, people who aren't paying that much attention, less educated voters, minority voters. But in fact, if you look at the data in same day registration, uh, it helped Republicans. Oh. It was amazing. Uh, you know, more Republicans voted, uh, used same day registration as a percent um, than Republic. So it's very interesting, you know, uh, how these things end up working out. I don't know if that's because the Republicans just had such a huge uh, voter drive going on in CD2, or I'm, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it was a Trump effect. You can certainly see in 2018 that there was a large drop off of Republican voters and that I feel certain that's what affected the race in, in CD2 and this just huge uh, increase in Republican voters in 2020. You can see the huge drop off in 2018 compared to 2016 in CD2. And I'm looking, I guess to add on to Meredith, Meredith, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were talking about in primaries in New Mexico it is proposed for yeah. the session. Maine has ranked choice voting for presidential primaries and other races. Yeah, Maine, Maine is the only state that has RCV everywhere. We'll see how they, you know, they did get the chance to vote on it again. They said, yeah, we want to keep it. So um, that was, I think, in 2018, but that. Yeah, um, I'd like to make, he's just very, make a comment yeah. um, on the open primaries and why I think that's so important in, in New Mexico. Um, anyway, uh, you know, people like my daughter who lives in actually in Boulder, Colorado, but, you know, a uh, lot of her generation are so disaffected with both parties and, the, you know, the money in politics, the toxicity of the campaigns just, um, you know, the inability to get anything done, and so on. And as I think more and more people, um, especially we're going to have a lot of, you know, Republicans, I think, who are going to be disaffected from what happened in the, like, since January 6, I, I think a lot of people will register as independents. And um, I think the more that I think it's healthy for democracy to have independent voters and very important for our secretary of state and our county clerks to be independents. You know, I think there's a bill also, I don't know the bill number that's in uh, our current session that actually is, is looking at requiring uh, county clerks and secretary of state to be nonpartisan. How wow. can they be nonpartisan if they have to run as a Democrat or Republican? No, no, I mean, this would be, if it passes, then they would register as independents. Hmm. And then they would, and then when they were on the ballot, there could be a, they would be on the ballot and then a Republican and a Democrat? No, there would be no. So uh, the no. St. Louis campaign in, um, uh, the, the, the campaign that we did in St. Louis was also in partnership with the Open Primaries Group. Um, and so it being nonpartisan means that there is no descriptor about what party yeah. you're in. So you have to know about the candidate themselves. The difficulty about doing that with a, without any kind of voting method reform is that you have a lot of spoilers. So it means that let's say you have four candidates, um, you could split the vote four ways and someone wins with 26% of the vote. Um, and you see that a lot in the nonpartisan uh, campaigns that we see out in uh, Seattle. Uh, so Seattle City Council, they have democracy dollars, which means that it's really easy to fundraise as a, for, for city council positions, which means tons of people run. We have, there, were, there was a campaign that had 10 candidates running. Someone won with, I think, some like 15% of the vote. So it doesn't make people happy when the losers have more than the winner. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, you know, we always end up knowing people's party. I mean, look at the city of Albuquerque, uh, big city contest. 
you know, everyone knew Mayor Barry was a Republican, I think, and everyone knows that, you know, uh, the current mayor is a Democrat. I mean, these are not, I mean, so nonpartisan races have been around a long time and it, it research shows that people end up do knowing what party people belong to and that there are partisan races in those localities, even though no one is partisan and it's not on the ballot. Um, so I think that that's interesting. I mean, I, you know, I think that for down ballot contests, you know, partisanship is a big cue for voters. Um, there's not a lot of information that gets through. Um, people are not relying on heuristics um, more than anything else once you move, especially down ballot that far. Um, you know, would that create greater competency or, you know, what, what is the goal there? Is that just trying to down regulate sort of the noise. Um, all these people come from a political position. Is it well, it would be like the judicial races, the, you know, retention judicial races. Um, I think it, you know, just as important as a message to be independent of the parties. Um, you know, we want our elections to be free, fair and accessible. And you know it's hard when the parties are uh, uh, making a lot of noise. When well, you said heuristics. a number of judges have said, you know, we should be independent, and you should vote on what our qualifications are. So yeah, to Meredith's point, um, you guys are adding. I'm not getting all these on. Okay, I. Okay, we got the St. Louis. You all ought to look at the chat because there are some um, URLs on there. And I think I'm down to Becky Shanklin. How did Republican versus Democrat spending compare in the Georgia runoff? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure on the totals for the the runoff at this point. I do know that they were. Uh, you know, it was like 500 million more dollars. It was also was a lot more money in a very short time. But I, I don't know the breakdowns. Well, I know in Georgia, since I think I made over a thousand calls into Georgia for a month, um, there were, they had the entire United States calling in. They had the East Coast, Midwest, and the West, and everyone was calling into Georgia. And I'm, they must have never turned on a television because there probably couldn't have possibly been a show because they had so many advertisements. Yeah, uh, it was unbelievable, unbelievable. But I will say that calling into Georgia was far more pleasant in the most part than calling Southern New Mexico. Just going to say that. Um, <laughs> so, so if you look on your chat, everyone, you can see that Felix um, with the Center for Election Science left a URL down here, right? Felix? Oh, yeah, that's just because um, yeah. uh, uh, I believe Meredith was saying how her daughter was um, in Boulder, Colorado, but we have a campaign going in Denver, Colorado right now. Um, the city council is reviewing its charter. Um, and uh, so, you know, they're, they're considering switching to rank choice voting or, or approval voting. And so I just dropped that information in there. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a one trick pony. Thank you. That's okay. I did think I did all the chat. I wanted to ask a question which we didn't really cover and perhaps it's not in your purview. Um, I am astounded because I had never called into another state. Honestly, I just called New Mexico. So when I was calling into Georgia, I was absolutely astounded at the voter suppression because I was using this uh, voter this democratic voter thing. So presumably all these people were either extremely high ideology independents or they were Democrats. So it didn't actually tell me what they were, but in different counties, different things were occurring. Sometimes they had early voting, I don't know, every day. Some only had one day, some had Saturdays, some had Sundays, some had neither. Uh, in Cobb County, which is very heavily Democratic, now that I know this, I would never even heard of it before. Um, on voter day, they were refusing to give anyone provisional ballots. There were people I talked to who had requested absentee ballots, like in December, and this was, you know, this was, or at the end of November even, and they hadn't received them yet. They had a hotline, a Democratic hotline. Uh, that people could call and they had to do a lot over in Cobb County. So anyway, my point of this is that what I would hope, I guess, I mean, I don't know, federal level, whatever, but 
we have a serious voting problem. We have serious voting suppression problems. I don't think I'm aware of it in New Mexico. Um, I'm sure all of you will correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, but they do. Um, one lady I spoke to who was an African-American lady, I said, well, do you feel okay about voting? And I, she took it in a different way than I meant it. And she said, oh yeah, she says, those are very nice white people over there and they're nice to me. And I thought, I didn't say anything, but I thought really what a horrible thing to have to say or think about, you know what I mean? So I think that it's really sad that in America, we don't let people vote. It's not that we're pushing that and we should have, everyone should vote. And you apparently- know, Counties are very resourced differently. There are poor counties and there are rich counties and local uh, voter uh, or election administration is a local thing in New Mexico. It's, it's actually in some ways, I mean, we have legislated a lot of very specific things, but even in Albuquerque, they have longer hours for early voting and they have them on Sundays. And so, you know, you can do the bare minimum as a county clerk, or you can choose to do more. Um, and that creates differences even in our own state. Um, you know, you can, if you look over at some places like Texas and Montana, some states are, some local uh, jurisdictions are still counting votes by hand. Um, so the differences in resources across election administration units is, is really huge. Um, that impacts their ability to offer the same things. Uh, bigger counties have, you know, much more opportunities for voting like Bernalillo County does than, uh, you know, counties in the rest of the state. Um, so, you know, if you're a rural state, if you're, you know, if you're, you know, one of our many <laughs> rural counties, you know, just thinking about how to set up sort of vote centers and, you know, where to put those is, is much more complicated. There's more reliance on absentee and local. So there's just a lot of differences in election administration that result in some of these differences that I, I don't think are um, always, you know, voter suppression per se in, in like that's the attempt of that. Sometimes it's just a resource issue between uh, different, different, um, different election units and you know different people care about this differently different county clerks care about that you can see it even in our own state um how they train how much money they give how much you know i mean it's just it, it varies a lot so um i do think that one huge problem i've always been a supporter of a national popular vote but uh i think that and sort of federalizing our elections in some way because Frankly, I think one of the problems with this election is that, you know, the election in Wisconsin is not the election in California. They're completely different election administrations. And, you know, if you go, well, why is that state over there doing that? Why can't Arizona just tell us what their votes are? Why is it taking so long, you know, for them to tell us that? Well, you know, they have to wait nine days for all their votes to come. So, you know, there's all these intricacies and differences across each election unit, you know, in, in the states because it's so local. And I think one long term problem, if we do want to move to some sort of national popular vote, is we have to think about federalizing the elections because the, you know, voter opportunities, thinking of voter suppression, are not the same. You know, in Vermont, uh, a, a prisoner gets to vote even when they're in prison. That doesn't happen anywhere else in the nation. And you know, in uh, you know Washington and California, you know, you have forever to get your vote in. And if your vote doesn't have a postmark, they'll just assume that you sent your vote in whenever you signed your form. So you know, that's very different than say, you know, Colorado, which is sort of, I would say has the top election administration in the country where, you know, they say, hey, you got to get your vote in by election day and uh, that's it, you know, um, or, or other states that do that. Actually, I don't think uh, they're one of those. Um, but so there's this grand difference in our election rules. And I think we need to, you know, think about some sort of federalization of that uh, in order to move to a fair process for, uh, a popular vote initiative. Interesting. Yes, thank you. So anyone else have a question before we let this resource leave us? Otherwise we're all okay. 
Well, we want to thank you so much. I mean, oh, I think my head hurts. Um, but good. I thank you so much for coming. You. Sorry, the I snow. enjoyed talking to you very much. Your yeah, well, thank and, you. And so, uh, questions were fantastic. A little virtual. Doing it. Thank you. Thank you. In thank February, you, Meredith. Good to see you. In February. Good to see you. League day on the 18th and lunch with the leader will be on Tuesday, the 16th. Just a little heads up. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.